Welcome to St. Timothy Lutheran Church for our online worship on this fourth Sunday after Epiphany and the Sunday of our annual meeting. So if you're watching this on Sunday morning before 11 a.m., uh, please do log on to the Zoom annual meeting. And that is kind of the theme for the day. These themes of church, community, and asking ourselves the question that is asked of Jesus in this gospel text for today. What would you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? We worship and praise our God with the responsive reading of Psalm 111. Alleluia. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. with you. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. It's time for the children's sermon, and the rest of you, you can listen in too, because I'm going to talk about a big word, authority. And authority, it's somebody who's kind of an expert. They know a lot about something, and it's also an authority is, is someone who can set the rules and say what you should do and what you shouldn't do. 
And we have many authorities in our lives. Uh, our mom and dad, their authorities, they say, you go to bed at this time, you get up at this time, here's when you need to do your schoolwork. They set rules for what you can do and not do. Who are some others? Police, yeah. Police are authorities. Uh, yeah, sometimes if I'm driving too fast from home to come over here to church, the police will turn on their lights and I have to pull over and I roll down the window of the car and they give me a ticket and they say, you're going too fast again. But you know the authorities that I always had the most trouble with were my teachers when I was in in grade school because, well, everything outside the window was always more interesting than anything happening in the classroom. So I was always kind of looking out here and what's going on, and then I would hear the teacher say, David, pay attention. You're looking out the window again. Or, you know, there would be times when we would, we would have to line up in the hallway and we'd have to go to the restroom or go to the lunchroom and we'd be walking like this, except I would be looking around and kind of wandering and they'd say, David, you're wandering, walk in a line. And there was this one kid and his name was Gene. And Gene would make a game of it because when we had to walk to the lunchroom, he'd go, all right, hi, hi. And they'd say, Gene, don't you do that, because they knew he was kind of making fun of this. And I got the feeling that the authority of my teachers, it always made me nervous and anxious and afraid because it's kind of like they were always ready to say, you're doing it wrong, or don't do this, or don't do that. And it made me nervous and afraid and sometimes made me feel small because I was being criticized. That's one kind of authority. But you know, there's another way authority is used. There are people who use their authority not to say no, 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 but to build you up so that you feel good about yourself and who you are and, and you're able to do things better. I mean, your mom and dad do that too. They use their authority to love you and to forgive you and to guide you and to help you. And they encourage you. Uh, my doctor is an authority. He, you know, he can say, David, you need to take this medicine and, and that's going to help you. And you're going to feel better and you're going to feel stronger and you're going to sleep better. And you're just going to feel much better about everything. He uses his authority so that I live better and that I'm happier, and that I feel good. You know, Jesus, he uses his authority kind of like that. You know, he, he would heal people, he'd lay hands on people, or we had a story about somebody with an evil spirit, and he'd say, come out of him, and Jesus was using his authority. He'd use his authority not just to heal, but also to bless, and to encourage people. And Jesus uses his authority with us sometimes to say, you know, you're not like just everybody else. And even though you can't do something that this friend or that person does and you might feel bad, I made you the way you are for a special purpose. You're special the way you are. And I want you to be yourself. Jesus uses his authority not to say, no, 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 but to say, you're loved, you're blessed, you're forgiven. He uses his authority not to make us feel small or afraid, but so we feel full of, of love and happiness and so we can live that way and feel much more, well, free. Jesus uses his authority to bless you. And I hope you know that authority and that blessing right now. And I hope also to see you very soon. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. They went to Capernaum, 
And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Today is a special day in our church year, a day that comes around once a year full of prep and surprise and the, the church coming all together. But today is not Christmas. It is not Easter. It's not even a lesser holy day like Epiphany or Christ the King or Transfiguration or even Ash Wednesday. The special story for this day can't be found anywhere in the Bible, nor is it inspired by some theological concept or, or a saint. The special day that we celebrate today, as we do every year, is called Annual Meeting Sunday. So we hope that we, uh, we see you all at 11 a.m. for our festive festivities. You won't want to miss out on the specialness. Because this day, this annual meeting day, doesn't have a Bible story that we get to read every year, like the Christmas story on Christmas Eve, we are today at the mercy of the lectionary texts, the ones that get assigned by the church for every Sunday, and this one for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. And so what we have for today is a story that at first glance might not seem to have much to do with our themes today, right? Community, being the church, unity. Because it's a story about Jesus performing an exorcism. Although I sense some of you that have been around for a few annual meetings in the past might not find it odd or actually might welcome an exorcism before we hunker down to talk about the budget for the coming year. No, it'll be a great budget. We don't have to exercise any demons there. But joking aside, I, I actually think this is great that we ended up with this text. It's great that we get an exorcism to get us into the annual meeting spirit. And, and here's why. All of us, as Christians, if we are to be the church who lives the love of Christ in the best, most faithful way that we can, then we all need a little or a lot of casting out of those unclean spirits now and again. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we're all like the little girl from the Exorcist movie. I think perhaps the, the movies have colored our opinion a little too much as to what exorcism means or what Jesus is really doing here in our biblical account of casting out the bad things from our life. I'm not, I'm not talking about head turning. I'm talking about living our Christian lives to the fullest. Free from, exercised, if you will, of the things in this life that, that would hold us back both as individuals and also as the church, as this church, as St. Timothy. And there's a line from our gospel story today that, that I want to focus on that will help us drill down on exactly this. And of all places, this line actually comes not from the mouth of Jesus, but from the man with the unclean spirit. He cries out to Jesus, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? And you know what? This evil spirit is really on to something. 
I mean, while I question the Spirit's motives for asking the question, obviously worried that he can't haunt this man much longer with Jesus on the scene, is this that much different from us in our lives? Shouldn't we too be asking Jesus, what have you to do with us? In other words, Jesus, what do you desire for us? What is your plan for us? What are you calling us away from and therefore into in this life? And when we ask that question, and we look to Jesus for an answer, are we ready for where God might be calling us? And if we are still talking about exorcism, also what God is calling us away from. Last week, I heard that a man by the name of Jude had died. His name at birth was actually Donald Eugene Motaka, but, but when I met him, he went by Father Jude. And Father Jude was one of the very few people in the entire world who holds the title Lutheran Monk. That's right, Lutheran Monk. I mean, there's just a handful of Lutheran monasteries in the world, a few in Europe and here in the United States, only one. St. Augustine's house in Oxford, Michigan, about an hour north of Detroit. And at the time I made my pilgrimage to St. Augustine's house, Father Jude was one of only three professed brothers who lived and worked and prayed at the monastery. I actually went on retreat to the monastery the week or two before I began here at St. Timothy, the fall of 2016. And before I began here, I wanted to get away. I wanted to get away before I started this new call, this new time in my life. I wanted to pray. I I wanted to get away from everything. I wanted to read through the Gospels and center myself in the life and ministry of Jesus before I started my own ministry. And while I was there, I met this quirky old man named Father Jude. At the monastery... He was best known for his sharp sense of humor, his boisterous laugh, and his keen intelligence. You would often find him in the garage on the campus, making something out of wood, or feeding the cats who seemed to follow him around. They did follow him around. And during my stay, I learned that Father Jude and I actually had some things in common. We both grew up in South Central Pennsylvania, and we both attended Yale Divinity School. And during time between prayer or over our simple meals, we swapped stories of our home state or the few professors who had been at Yale long enough to span both of our tenures. Well, I left the monastery after my week's stay, and I haven't been back. It's the one place that I always say I'm going to make time for. Each year I claim that it will be the year I'll go back and I'll, I'll vi- visit those, those monks, see Father Jude, but I never did. I mean, still I try to stay up on what they are doing. I read the quarterly newsletter. I, I donate some money to their new building, uh, a new place for the monks to stay in a guest house. I even get a Christmas card from them. And then the other day, I read that Father Jude had died. And today, as we have our annual meeting, and we reflect on this story from Jesus' ministry, I, I, I can't help but think, think of him. Because for me, Father Jude's life was an answer to the question we ask ourselves today. Jesus, what have you to do with me? Before becoming a monk, Father Jude spent a short time in pastoral ministry and then left to work in politics and later as an IT technician. But as the years of his life went by, something happened. Something drew him to the monastery, to a life devoted to that community of of woodworking and prayer. What had Jesus to do with him? 
It turned out it wasn't IT or his brief career in politics. It was a black habit and a tiny, little, rarely talked about Lutheran monastery tucked down a wooded back road in Michigan. Unlike Father Jude, not all of us, in fact, very few of us are called to become monks. I mean, this was actually one of Martin Luther's core tenets of the Reformation. Being a monk is not some higher calling than being a barber. We can live out faithful Christian lives doing either. But like Father Jude, we too are called in our lives to, the, to answer the question for ourselves, Jesus, what have you to do with us? What are those, those parts of our lives that should be cast aside, exercised, in fact? What are those parts of our lives that we should run towards and be a part of? Where, O oh Christ, are you calling me? And on this festival day of the holy and blessed annual meeting, we ask the very same question of everyone here, to all the members and friends of St. Timothy Lutheran Church, what are those parts of our life together that can or should be cast aside? And what are those parts of this life together, this amazing life of living Christ's love and community that we should run towards and be a part of? Where, O oh Christ, are you calling us? What would you have us do, Jesus of Nazareth? Just like the monk and just like the barber, each of us has a unique role to play. What's yours? For being the church, being this church, is all about coming together to figure out, to figure out our own answer to exactly that question. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need.
O Holy One, we pray for all those who share the gospel and proclaim the grace and love of Christ throughout the world. We pray especially on this day for our congregation of faith, for all those who make this place home, who come here to find out what it means to live the love of Christ in their lives. Help us to answer the question, O Christ, what would you have us do? Hear us, O God. O Lord of all that is, we pray for your creation, for plants and animals. We pray for those who are tasked with protecting our natural world. Hear us, O God. O Lord of all, we pray for governments and leaders in every land and place. We pray for all leaders who are trying to navigate the pandemic, for all those who are responsible for the well-being of civil society. Hear us, O God. O great physician, we pray for those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, for those who are sick and hospitalized, for those struggling with mental illness, for those who are hungry or homeless and all in need. Especially this day, we pray for the healing of Larry and Tony Hansler and Eleanor Meshek. Hear us, O God. O God, who is with us in our very beginning, you see us at our end as well. We give you thanks this day for the covenant God made with us in the waters of baptism. And we give you thanks for those who have died in the Lord. We remember especially this day, Father Jude. And we commend all who have gone before us to the everlasting mercy of your eternal care. Hear us, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken out loud or on the silence of our hearts. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
we celebrate the Holy and Blessed Eucharist, through which our Lord Jesus Christ comes to us in the bread and the wine, becoming his body and blood, to give us his very self for our life, to know his love, for our forgiveness, and that we may taste eternal life. Let us begin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed, blessed are you, holy God. You are the life and light of all. By your powerful word, you created all things. Through the prophets, you called your people to be a light to the nations. Blessed are you for Jesus, your son, our brother. For he is your light shining in our darkness and revealing to us your mercy and might. To reveal to us the fullness of your divine love and presence. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink from this, all of you. For this is the cup of a new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you and for all people, for the remission of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his preaching and healing, his dying and rising, and his promise to come again, we await that day when all the universe will rejoice in your holy and life-giving light. By your Spirit, bless us and this meal that, refreshed with this heavenly food, we too might be light for the world, revealing the brilliance, the love of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Filled with hope, we pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, will not hunger, and whoever believes in me will not be thirsty. Taste now and see the goodness of the Lord. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ which is shed for you. Lord, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, you strengthen us for our journey. Send us forth now from this banquet nourished in body and in spirit to proclaim your good news and to serve others in your name. Amen. Receive now our Lord's blessing. May the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge, fill you with all the fullness of God. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us at worship today. It's always so special when we can gather online. Um, after this worship service, we're gonna be showing you a very special video from some very special people, and that's you, the people of St. Timothy, who helped make our Hesed House ministry this month possible. Thank you again, one and all, and um, stay tuned so you can see a little bit of uh, behind the scenes and how this all works. And then also, one other very important thing, don't forget at 11 o'clock today is our annual meeting. So go grab yourself some breakfast if you get a chance and come back and tune in to the link that Sherry sent out. And you can also find that link on our website so you can be with us for our very important meeting. So we'll see you then at the meeting at 11 and then we'll catch you next week at Worship Online. Take care everyone, bye-bye. So what are you guys working on, Mr. Overham? Uh, hard boiling 20 dozen eggs. How many guys, how many do you feed at a time, do you know? A hundred. A hundred? Wow. A hundred lunches. All right, good team. And everybody gets a sandwich and a piece of fruit and some cookies and a piece of cheese. Nice. And what else, John? Potato, you know, a snack. And a snack. Potato chips. Potato chips. I'm hard boiling 20 mm -hmm. dozen and there's only four dozen left. Now, is these all donations from the church congregation? Yes. People of God, what are we called to do? Live the love of Christ. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.